So, Zach, it's just about that time. I think it is. You ready to roll? I'm ready to roll. How about you? Ready. So, happy noon time on this Monday after Easter. It's good to be with everybody. This is the Isolation Bible Study, and uh, it's a study that began with this whole coronavirus exile. It happens Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, Zach and I are from Concordia, but man, anybody's welcome. We're glad to have anybody join us that, that would like to join us. And on Monday, we, we have a tendency, at least our pattern so far, is that we talk about the text and the theme from the weekend. We go a little bit further into that. Uh, Wednesday, we've been talking about the book of Psalms because that's a great place for comfort and encouragement in a stressful time. And then on Friday, we've done a number of different things, and I have no idea what we're going to do this coming Friday, but I'll bet you I'll bet you we'll know that by Friday. We will be around on Friday and talk about something. <laughs> Even if we're making it up. Yeah. So, well, Zach, let's, uh, let's get started. I'll say a prayer, and then uh, why don't we dig into John chapter 20? So, all right. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for the chance to, to be in your word, to uh, spend this time together, and Lord, for this technology that allows us to communicate and, and interact across uh, the country, across the world, across our community. We're just blessed by that, Father. So use this time for encouragement and strengthening that we might be better prepared to deal with the, the challenges and questions and emotions that we face during this, uh, this difficult time. We pray all this and we commend our very lives to you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, Zach, what, uh, what do you have in store for us today? I know we're in John chapter 20, and we're going to talk about that great, great Easter story from yesterday. But where do you want to start out? Well, so I figured what we could do is we could just kind of walk through the text. And then um, today... Whoops, are you there, Zach? Zach I think Zach had a technical just glitch. To ask. Whoops, Zach, we lost you for a minute. Are you uh, oh. are you okay? I I think I think I'm good. Can you can okay. you hear me okay? Can you see me I can hear okay? You now. We got you now. All right. Yeah, so, you didn't uh, pass out, right? And no, no, I'm still I'm still here. We're okay. we're I, I I think I think we're still good. Uh, so I just want to walk through the text and then instead of three points, we're going to ask two questions that this text le leads us to ask, which are which are really important questions. Did you get prior so, approval for that, Zach? Uh, you know what? Um, no. Oh, okay. So this this Bible study is being played under protest. I just I just want to oh. go on the record with that. But got it. Go ahead, Zach. Dig in. So if you got a Bible, you can open to John chapter 20, or you know, if you use the U version app, go to John chapter 20 and Okay, not good. Not good. TJ, he's frozen up again. Morning. Jesus has risen from the dead. Yeah, but Zach. The disciples and you're the women. freezing up. Yeah. Zach, Zach, you're going to oh. maybe, uh, maybe switch to your phone, go over the air or something? Hmm. Let me, uh, let me try something else. I wonder. Hold on. So, folks, this is in real time. You're seeing it as it happens. This is... Uh, right. This is, and it happens a lot like this. This is me and Pastor TJ trying to get Zach to get with the program. It's difficult, often painful. Yeah. Um, but TJ, what else, what other option do we have? Someone's got to wrangle this guy. Okay, Zach, I paused your video so you could adjust. Tell yeah. me when you're ready. All right. Uh, hold on just a second. I don't know what he's doing. Seeing if I can get a more stable... All right, internet connection here. Lay down on the floor by the Wi-Fi router, okay? Isn't that just like yeah, Zach exactly. to, blame, to blame his stability on the internet connection? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, it's not just an internet connection issue. I we 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 all know that. All right, let's see if uh, that is any more stable. Am I we'll am I there? Minutes. Okay. So uh, back to John chapter 20, a little bit of context here for you. Uh, Jesus has just risen from the dead. Uh, the disciples and the women who first come to the tomb, very famously, they don't know that Jesus has risen from the dead. And one of the women that comes to the tomb on that Easter morning is Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, one of the dear friends of Jesus. Uh, she's had demons cast out of her by Jesus. She's been at a lot of the seminal moments in Jesus' life. And so John 20, beginning at verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, 
And uh, the New Testament written in Greek and the Greek word here for this crying word is the word kaleo. And uh, this isn't just like a cry, this is a wail. And so if you've ever had one of those moments where you're so despondent that you do an ugly cry, that's what's going on here with Mary. She has an ugly cry and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And when she looks into the tomb, this is verse 12, she sees two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Now, um, when it comes to this little section here in verse 12, there are three things that I want you to pick up on. Uh, one is the word seated. Uh, two is the word body, Jesus' body. And then the third thing I want you to pick up on is where the angels are seated, uh, one at Jesus' head and the other at Jesus' foot. Now, um, we'll start with, with Jesus' body. One of the things that's big about Easter is that when Jesus rises, right, um, he doesn't just rise spiritually. This isn't just a nice myth. This isn't one of these things that we look at and go, okay, this is something that is meant to give us um, kind of an ambiguous hope. Christians believe that Jesus rose from the dead in his body. Uh, there's this real faint... Yeah, there's this uh, famous poem by a guy named John Updike. He was a poet who lived in the 20th century. And uh, the way he opens this, this poem is great. Uh, he says, make no mistake, if Jesus rose at all, it was as his body. And then he goes into a little bit of science and biology. He says, if the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecule remits, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. And, and, and his kind of point there in fancy language, right, yeah, is sure. um, what was decaying came back together. What was falling apart, going through what every body goes through after it dies, all of that was reversed when Jesus had risen. Now, part of the reason this is important is because when it comes to our bodies, Jesus cares about what happens to them, which at a time during a pandemic, it's kind of important that Jesus cares what happens to our bodies. Yeah, I love that, Zach, because that's one of the things we talked about yesterday, that we need to understand that this is a physical resurrection, that our, our God and our Savior isn't just a spiritual problem solver. He is a physical God who cares about our spiritual well-being and our physical well-being and intends that, that both be united and healthy and happy in this life and for eternity. And so when Jesus' body rises, right, um, he's out of the tomb. But then where Jesus' body was, there are these angels, these two angels. And two things I want you to notice. Uh, one is seated at the head of where Jesus' body was, and the other is seated at the foot of where Jesus' body was. Now, whenever you see a picture like this, a lot of times it's helpful in the Bible to ask, where have I seen this kind of picture before? And there is actually a very famous picture. You don't even need to know the Bible to know this picture. You just need to know Indiana Jones, and you will know the picture. Um, in the Old Testament, there was a box. It was called the Ark of the Covenant, right? It does lots of things. It's the place where God dwelled. If you need to melt Nazis, it's really handy for that. It does a lot of great things. And uh, on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, there were these two angels, these two cherubim. And if you see depictions of it, right, they're always kneeling or sometimes they're standing. The idea is because this was the throne of God in ancient Israelite thinking, um, the angels would bow or stand at attention before God. But here, right, in what kind of looks like the Ark of the Covenant, there's this, there's this big slab of stone where Jesus' body was laid, and you got an angel at the same place as they were at the Ark of the Covenant. They're not kneeling. They're not standing at attention. They're what? Sitting. Because here's the idea. Um, the Ark of the Covenant was basically the box on which God was enthroned. But on Easter, God gets out of his box. Yeah, the box was empty. That's cool. That's a really cool picture. It also is really neat to know that now we can add to Adam's Easter song repertoire, repertoire the, uh, the Indiana Jones theme. Yeah, exactly, because it fits perfectly, right? <laughs> and so Christ is gone, but, but here's the thing. At this point, the women, the disciples... Nobody gets what, is, what has actually happened. This is one of the things we miss, right? Um, after Jesus died, here's how many Christians there were. Zero. None. Because when Jesus died, you know what else died with Jesus? No believers. Their hope. 
Yeah. Uh, so Mary doesn't believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. The disciples, uh, they, they're they still struggling to believe. There's a little indication that, that John is kind of catching on. Uh-oh, we lost Zach again. Good news is, we may have lost Zach, but Joy, in her infinite wisdom and preparation, has provided me with a joke to share with you while we're waiting for Pastor Zach to come back to life again. Seems appropriate that we call it that, right? On Easter yeah. Monday? Yep. So, so here's a joke. Everybody ready? Okay. Remember, this is Joy. This is from Joy. Sunday and Monday are in a fight. Who wins? Da, 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 da. You probably don't need that much time. It's easy. Sunday. Monday's a weekday. I don't know. Do you think, think Joy would approve of that delivery? It's a week day. Yeah, it's a week Right, day. right. Yeah, I don't know. Joy, do you have another one? Because that, mm. you know, one of Joy's aspirations is to write a joke book. Did you know that? I didn't know that. No. You know, I know she's our director of yeah. marketing and special events, and she does a great job with all of that. Her jokes are great also. Mm, yeah. You know, I'm wondering, TJ, do you think, do you think Zach needs a new Henway? For, uh, he, uh huh, what what's a Henway? Uh, two or three pounds. Nice. That's, Got that's it. purely that's purely for joy too. That's her favorite joke of all time. That that is, yeah. So you know what though, getting back to the Bible study for just a minute, while Zach's doing his thing, the the thing that I think is absolutely amazing about the the picture that we were just talking about is that. The tomb is empty, right? That, that right. symbolism. I, until we were talking about this in getting ready for this Bible study, I'd never, never seen that or even picked up on that concept. That it's not just it's not just the the, the picture of the cherubim at the Ark of the Covenant, but the detail that I love is that now instead of standing at attention, instead of kneeling in worship, they're sitting because they're off duty, right? I mean, it's uh, right. You know, especially for here in San Antonio, military town, we get that whole idea of parade rest. We get the idea of standing at attention. And of course, the idea of kneeling in worship. None of that's going on because now the box is empty. There is no, that's not the presence of God anymore. It's the risen Christ. So I love, I love that, that whole part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know what? We have a question on Facebook, Pastor, that okay. uh, somebody was asking about uh, the thief on the cross and saying, what about the thief on the cross? Were, were they a believer? And so that, I thought that was an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Now, before we get to that, Zach, are you, are you actually back or is this an apparition? I am. I'm back, I think. And hopefully I'll stay back. You know, uh, Zach, you are smoother than ever too. So that's good. Wi-Fi is uh, not reliable right now. But you know what? Hopefully cellular will work a little bit better. There you go. So, Zach, we're just, we're just kind of following up on the point about yeah. the angels and the cherubim and the fact that they're, they're not in worship. They're not on attention, at attention. They're uh, actually they're, they're sitting down. They're off duty, right? Yep. Um, so why don't we press on? If we have time, we'll come back to this question because somebody, somebody posed a question. Well, wait a minute. No Christians. What about the thief on the cross? who asked uh, Jesus for deliverance, right? Asked him to save him, and Jesus assured him of that. You want to do that now, or you want to come back to it? Uh, you know what? It's such a great question. Let's just, let's just pause and, fo and focus on that, on that right now. So here's the thing. Before Jesus died, there were lots of people who believed in him, um, including this thief on the cross who cried out into desperation. The disciples believed in him. The women believed in him. The problem was their expectations of him were always a little off. Now, Jesus didn't hide the ball, right? Um, he said to his disciples many times, hey, um, so here's the thing. I'm going to be handed over to uh, my enemies by my enemies, and they're going to kill me. I'm going to rise. But the disciples, their expectations were so different as to what a Messiah would be um, that they didn't quite get the whole resurrection thing. Uh, the thief on the cross he, he saved because he believes Jesus' words in that moment. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Doesn't mean that he necessarily gets the whole resurrection thing right now, but then again, he wasn't around to see the resurrection. Uh, what seems to have happened, right, is the disciples follow Jesus because they believe him. Then he dies, 
and their faith, their hope, it all's wrecked. The disciples want to go back and be fishermen. And it's not until he's raised that they realize, oh, that stuff about him rising from the dead, he, he really meant that. He really meant that he was going to die. My expectations were all wrong, which, by the way, probably is a good lesson for us. We ought to be very careful with the expectations that we have of God. God, you better do it this way. You know, Zach, that's a perfect segue, too, to where we go next with this, with our Bible study, because the, the angel asks the question, right? Woman, why mm -hmm. are you crying? Yeah. And you get the sense that if she, if she responds to him, she's going to get a profound answer from an angelic being about the resurrection of Jesus, but she doesn't give him an answer. She doesn't, it's as if she just kind of turns on her heels and pays no attention to what's going on. And I think it goes back to her expectations, right? Exactly. She, she's still stuck with this vision in her head. Someone has stolen Jesus' body. As you mentioned in your message, grave robbery, robbery was very common in the ancient worlds. And so she says, hey, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. And then she turns around, <laughs> which, is, which is funny, because if you see an angel, um, wouldn't you at least want to stop and stare for just a second? She doesn't, because she's so locked in to her idea that dead people stay dead. There's no way that Jesus has risen from the dead. And now he has been stolen as he is dead out of his tomb. Well, I've got to believe, yeah. I've got to believe, Zach, that she's so, she's so uh, traumatized by this and so wrapped up in this idea that his body has been stolen, his body of all, of all people, that she doesn't even realize they're angels, right? I, I'm guessing that that, that that recognition didn't happen until later because I don't think you look away from angels, Unless you don't see them as angels at all. She is on a mission to find Jesus' body um, because she wants to anoint it. She wants to make sure that it gets the proper burial that she thinks his body deserves. And so she turns around from the angels. And who does she see? This is verse 14, right? She sees Jesus, but she doesn't realize that it was Jesus. Now, was that because Jesus looked totally different? Again, probably not. But she had an expectation. Dead people stay dead. Hmm. She's not going to be looking and seeing Jesus. And if she sees Jesus, right, uh, she would probably think, oh, I'm going a little crazy here. Now, one of the reasons that we believe in the resurrection is because over and over again in stories like these, we see that there was no expectation that a resurrection was going to happen. Okay, Mary didn't expect to see Jesus alive, which is why when she sees Jesus alive, she doesn't even know it's Jesus. And so uh, Mary is distraught. Jesus begins speaking to her. Verse 15, he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And we'll come back to those two questions in a little bit. Uh, thinking that Jesus was the gardener, and uh, you talked about this in your message too, right? Um, in Genesis 3, things go from garden to a grave because Adam and me fall into sin and they die. Now everything is getting reversed. We're going from a grave, Jesus is buried, to a garden. And she says, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll come and get him. And Jesus says to her, Mary. And what happens? Instant recognition. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's, that, there's that real famous line in John 10, right? My sheep know my voice, and they listen to me. And so uh, Mary knows who's speaking to her now. And then Jesus says to her, verse 17, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Now, that's kind of a weird line. Yeah, that's, this is, I think people are going to be blessed by this little understanding, Zach, because this is one of those questions that I hear from people a lot. What, why couldn't she hold on to him, or what was going on? Or, go ahead, fire away. Because it kind of feels like she just wants to give him a big bear hug, right? Uh, which is very understandable because she thought that he was going to be dead and stay that way. But, but Jesus actually tells her, right, why she shouldn't hold on to him. It's because he has not yet ascended to his father. In other words, uh, the ascension hasn't happened yet. He's going to be around. She's going to be able to see him again. She's going to be able to talk to him again. He's sticking with her. It's kind of like if you're a parent of little kids and they're hanging all over you all the time. Sometimes you're just like, hey, 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 
Uh, you don't have to hold on to me. Don't worry. I'm just going over here. I'll be right back. Yeah, I'm not That's going what Jesus anywhere. says to Mary. Now, Jesus actually gives Mary a job to do, right? And the job begins with the word. And uh, it's a word that Jesus gives to all of us. He gives it to the disciples at the end of Matthew 28. And uh, the word is, is go. And so this is Mary Magdalene's, what I like to call it is Mary Magdalene's great commission, right? Jesus gives to his disciples at the end of Matthew a great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. Okay, Jesus says to Mary Magdalene, go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and uh, your God. Now, um, right here is a precious promise, right? Because God is not just Jesus God, he's our God. God is not just Jesus Father, he's our Father, just like we say in the Lord's Prayer. But that only happens because of Jesus. Yeah. Sometimes he's the one we'll that makes that work, creates the relationship, uh, connects us to the Father again, right? Sin yeah. separates us, Jesus reconnects us. And so sometimes we'll talk about Jesus as a priest, which basically means that Jesus is, is a mediator. He's a mediator between God and man. If you go back to the Old Testament, right, uh, you have these priests, and what do they do? They would stand at the temple, and they would offer all these sacrifices, and they would bring all these prayers to God on behalf of the people. Uh, Jesus does that for us, which means how many priests do we need? Well, we don't need, we have the one priest that we need, the, the one bridge. We talked about the bridge illustration the other day in Bible study. The one bridge that we need between God and man, who's Jesus. And so like you and I, we can talk about Jesus, but we're not going to be able to like somehow get you to Jesus in any more special way than you can just go straight to yourself, uh, to God, uh, because of Jesus. You, you have access to God because of Christ. That's one of those, that's one of those uh, great things, Zach, that we get to share with folks, because a lot of times people will ask us to pray, and we love praying for people, praying for mm -hmm. their situations, their needs, rejoicing with them, whatever it might be. But I know that there are folks from time to time who feel like when they ask us to pray, they're, they're getting the supercharged prayers. You know, like yeah. if they ask us to pray, they're getting prayers that get to God faster or get to God more directly or have more influence or sway. And uh, that's just not the way it works. No. We have the same bridge that they have. We have the same connector that they have. He's our God and he's their God because he is Jesus' father and we trust in him. We're going through Jesus. You can go through Jesus. And so the prayers, the prayers are all the same. This is one of the things that Luther discovered in the Reformation, right? Uh, there's, there's no reason why you can't read the Bible. There's no reason why you can't go to God in prayer. Uh, Luther called this the priesthood of all, all believers. believers, which yeah. means that every one of us is like a priest. Every one of us can go directly to God. And so we'd love to pray for you, but just so you know, um, our prayer power is no different than your prayer power. And so but with Jesus is pretty awesome. It's, it's amazing. Exactly. On that whole idea of priesthood of all believers, yeah. I also love the, the job that Jesus gives Mary. Because uh, we're talking about the pronouns, right? And, and the yeah. connectedness that comes through all of that. But I, I love what he actually asks her to do. Yeah. He asks her, verse 18, right, to go talk to the disciples. And she does. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. Now, the gospel is called the good news. In Greek, it's the euangelion, uh, you, which is uh, good, and angelion, which is actually where the Greek word for angel comes from, because angels are people who share news. And so Mary is actually, the, the Greek here is the news, it's the angelion that, that Mary shares. And so she's sharing like good news, gospel news. She's saying, I have seen the Lord. And that's, that's incredible news. Here, here's the thing, right? Before the disciples share the good news with anybody, Mary shares the good news with the disciples. Which is She's like first of, up to bat. Yeah. And it's the beauty of, of the priesthood of all believers, right? 
that yeah. sharing the good news isn't pastor work. No. It's not evangelist work. It's not teacher work. Sharing the good news, proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ crucified and risen is the work of all believers. Yeah. Easter, we, we know about Easter. The disciples found out about Easter because of a woman like Mary Magdalene, who was there to say, hey, I've seen the Lord. All that he said, all that he promised to do, he's done. And it changed the world. Hmm, for sure. Now, uh, part, part of the reason that, that, that I love this so much is because um, Mary, when she first gets to the tomb, right? She's where a lot of people are during this time, but just in life, which is life's hard. It's really hard. And so the angel asks Mary these two questions, and this is why we're doing two questions instead of three points, right? If you go back uh, to John chapter 20, right? Verse 15, he says to Mary, woman, why are you crying? That's question number one. And then question number two, um, who is it that you're looking for? Uh, question number one, why are you crying? I, uh, I'm guessing at least a few people who are watching right now could answer that question with a whole host of things, huh? So many things, so many, so many reasons. And that's not, that's not just coronavirus stuff. Life is hard and it's painful. And because of sin, there is so much brokenness and so much hurt. It, it, it touches every life. It affects us daily. And sometimes it affects us profoundly. But then the second question, right? Who is it you're looking for? And, and, and really, um, you can only get through your answer to the first question if you have the right answer to the second question. Yeah, and again, um, it goes to a pronoun, right? Yeah, because so often, um, here's what we do. We get stressed out about something, right? Something brings tears to our eyes. We have a loss or we have a struggle. Uh, we go through a tough time. We lose our job. We lose a person or uh, we get really sick or somebody we love, a kid goes off to college and, and it, it brings tears to our eyes. And sometimes we try to fix those times of tears, not with looking for someone, but by looking for something. In other words, we change the who to a what. What is it we're looking for? Oh, well, I, I can just fix my tears if I make more money. Or I can just fix my tears by heading over to this substance. Or I can just fix my tears by changing up my situation a little bit. Uh, we look for a what instead of for a who. But Jesus says, who is it that you're looking for? And the promise is, there's only one who that can ultimately and finally and forever wipe away every tear from your eyes. That's the beauty. That's the beauty of Easter, right, Zach? That, that we have a Savior who, who demonstrated who he is. He predicted his death. He foretold his resurrection and then did exactly what he said. No one else can do that. If, but if you can do that, then, then you can be trusted with whatever you say. And what he says is, he is always with us. What he says is that he died to take away our sin, that he died to reconnect us to the Father, that he died and went to prepare a place for us. And Easter says, true, 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 true. Every word of it true. And so uh, Revelation 21.4, I'll turn there and we can, we can end here. Um, this is what happens when we look for Jesus. Uh, this is John, the same one who wrote the Gospel of John, okay? And uh, John is being taken on a tour of heaven by an angel. Who knows? Maybe one of the same angels that were at the tomb, right? And uh, John in Revelation 21 verse 3 says that he hears a loud voice from the throne because Jesus is not on the tomb, right? He's on the throne. And the voice says, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God, right? Because he's our God, because he's Jesus God, just like he says in John 20. And then, verse 4, he will wipe away 
every tear from their eyes. Because of Easter, there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has been passed away. And um, this, this idea of the old order of things passing away, I'll put it this way, on Easter, the old order of things was just blown up. Because that's and not the, the intended way order was restored. And the best order. Yeah, the intended order. You know, one more thing, Zach, and I know we're a minute or so past our normal time, but I love the fact that there's no condemnation for Mary's tears. He asks, why are you crying? And, and, and we know that he's about to, because the way he has to answer, answer, who are you looking for? We know that, that he's about to wipe her tears away, but there's no condemnation. And, and that's the thing I think we need to realize in a time like this, when everything's up for grabs, when we don't have any kind of certainty and we don't know when things are going to go back to normal, whatever that will be, there's plenty of reason to hurt. And when we hurt, there's no condemnation. The thing we need to know is that we need to be seeking consolation and comfort and peace and encouragement in places that are healthy and in places that are good. We need to turn to Jesus and we need to turn to, to professionals and to friends and to others who can help lift us up and carry us along because it's easy to get off the who and think it's about the what. It's easy to think that it's about when we can, can end this isolation, stay-at-home kind of a situation. It's easy to think it's about, it's about when we will have uh, an economy that's strong again, or when we will have our job back, or when life will go back to normal and whatever it means. And the key is, that's not where it's at. There's no condemnation for the fact that we, that we have tears. There's just direction. Turn to me. You know, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in me, right? And so I think that's a, I think that's a beautiful point that you've made in this study. So for Wednesday, Psalm one, I think, is where we're going to be. And yeah, if you uh, want to, if you want to be uh, prepared and want to maybe think about questions that you have, we're going to dig into Psalm one, Uno, and uh, that's what we'll be doing on Wednesday. But right now, Zach, we need to sign off. Do you want to pray for us as we uh, as we wrap things up? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for today, and uh, thank you that Christ is risen, and because of that. Um, even through our tears, we know that those tears will one day be wiped away. Father, whatever it is we're carrying around, uh, we pray that we can take it to your throne of grace without any concern or worry, uh, because the grave is open, the tomb is empty, uh, your son is our priest, and through him we can approach you. We thank you for that privilege, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, dear friends. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you at noon on Wednesday. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Have a great day.